Thank you, Eric. Um, hi, I'm Natalie Myers. You all got an awful lot of emails from me. I'm so sorry. Thank you for coming. And um, so in my talk now and in our next activity, we're going to discuss the use of the PRESQT needs assessment and how it interrelates with past surveys on the topics of data sharing and um, on past surveys of people's um, expression of uh, both their own tool use and the tools they wish they had. Um, Brandon Greenwalt's here from Center for Social Research, and he's helped us stand our questionnaire up on Qualtrics. I'd like you to um, sing for your supper and do a little work for PresQT right away and participate in the survey. Brandon sent links to everybody, I think, so check your email, and in there you should have a link to the survey. Um, we're going to take about five minutes now and do the survey together. If you haven't received the email, um, I invite you to go to the PresQT website and um, you can actually um, click the link on my slides um, and uh, take the needs assessment right from the link on my slideshow. Um, so I'll give you a minute to find the survey. If you haven't found the survey in your email or on my slide, um, put your hand up. Don't be embarrassed. Brandon and I will walk around and get you started. But let's take five minutes and um, uh, you tell me about uh, how you share your data and what kind of tools you need. And then tomorrow morning, we'll have a look at our aggregate results from this group and uh, what kind of tools together we think they need. Um, anyone need help finding the survey or linking to it? Please put your hand up if you can't find it. Don't find it, it won't start, anything like that. Hi, right, in the interest of time, I'm going to start talking a little bit about the background of this, but if you're still working on the survey, go ahead. One of our audience questions was, what is the difference between sharing and publishing? And my response was that in some research groups and disciplines, it's quite common to have collaborators, maybe even in multiple countries, where you might share your data among collaborators before you publish as you work on your research together, um, but you haven't published it to the community at large or in relation to a journal article or even made it accessible to the general public yet often when you do that, the word you would use would be, I've published my data on such and such a day. On that day, people who read my article can access my supplemental file, or on that day, people in the whole world can access it at my open URL. So those are a couple ways of thinking of publish versus share, but I appreciate the questions and the interest in that because what it might mean to us is that when we roll this survey out to the broader audience, we need to have definitions near there that help people understand how they fit into the question set and uh, allows them to answer it in terms of their own discipline and their own research and their own practice. Um, this survey didn't come out of the blue. When we made our grant proposal, one of the things that we made a commitment to do was to get stakeholder input through the life of this planning grant. The needs assessment is one tool for doing that, for getting that stakeholder engagement going and input from broad communities. Um, the surveys that we looked at in working up our own survey and the surveys that we looked at in thinking about the PresQT project itself are listed here on this screen. Um, these are listed uh, in chronological order. Um, most recently, the um, open data researcher perspective uh, survey results were um, launched. I saw a presentation of it at Research Data Alliance in Barcelona. Um, the American Physical Society, um, in concert with Mike Hildreth's um, Open Math and Physical Sciences workshop that was um, funded by NSF, have uh, surveyed their members and we'll have a survey with results forthcoming. Um, Figshare, um, in association with Springer Nature and Digital Science, did a release last year called The State of Open Data. And um, Sandra's group, uh, Science Gateway Community Institute, did a um, 
survey uh, with an uh, article titled Science Gateways Today and Tomorrow. Wiley, some time ago, did a researcher data insights survey. And there are several others going back to 2009 um, that I have a link in the slides that you can access. Um, when we put the surveys in context, back in 2014, the Wiley respondents, about 52% of them said they shared data in some way or another. Um, then moving forward in 2015, when the Science Gateway audience was surveyed, 75% of them indicated that data collections were important to their research and education work, and they ranked it highly alongside data analysis tools and computational tools as um, something they needed to be able to do their research. Um, their interest in being able to rapidly publish or find domain-specific articles was slightly less, which shows us there's a tipping point in how people perceive data and how important it is to share it and share it early and often. Um, that compares as we move forward in time to the FigShare state of the data survey where 74% of respondents um, reported having made their own research data open at some point, and 90% um, who said they had never done so yet reported that they would consider doing it in the future. So even if you look at that brief time span between 2014 and 2016, more people report their willingness to share and actually sharing. If we look uh, more recently at the Elsevier survey, which is the most recent for which I have results, um, in that survey, 64% reported having shared their research data with others, and 73% said that having access to others' data would benefit their own research. So you can see that in a majority of cases, even going back to 2014, um, data sharing and tools to do it are becoming increasingly important. We're fortunate today to um, have, I think, Sherry, do you um, uh, see um, Figshare or um, Dan Valen or Anita DeWord on the remote connection? So we welcome Dan and Anita. And um, for Wiley, we don't have a guest online with us, um, but for this survey, um, if you have questions, you can email Tom Griffin. Um, the survey I first saw described in a Data One webinar back in uh, 2015. And um, in the Wiley survey, the primary output, um, they were looking at where sharing takes place, how big are files that people share, uh, questions like that. Liz Ferguson did a talk for Data One about the Wiley survey, and its primary output, beside a talk and um, some write-up that Liz has on her blog, is this infographic, which is in poster form. You can go download it. There's a link to it in my slides. But to me, it was kind of a marker of the first big publisher survey of who, how, and where do people share. If we move forward in time to the Science Gateways survey, um, we have Sandra with us from Science Gateways Community Institute, and I'll have her take the podium to describe uh, gateways for a moment and this, this survey, which had about 5,000 respondents. Yes, thank you, Natalie. Oh, yes. Yeah. So um, who hasn't heard about Science Gateways until today? Okay, everybody knows <laughs> about that. <laughs> so because... No, then I ask this question, I start to ask this question because I don't want to bore my audience. Like, oh, you find the same thing every time you come over. So um, only to say it once. So the science gateways is really, we are talking about end-to-end -end solutions from a user interface through middleware to hardware. And whether these are HVC or distributed computing infrastructures, data infrastructures, or even instruments in a lab. So we have really the increased complexity of of these infrastructures and research questions that we need to address them and science gateways address them. So that's the goal. To come to the, also science gateways are very actively used in the exceed infrastructure nationwide. And I'd like to show this since December because we have 77% of users using now exceed via science gateways um, compared to users who are using it via command line, if you look at this statistic. So that is very impressive. 
And we did this survey in 2014 and we sent it out to 29,000 people and we got almost 5,000 answers, which is great. So we hope to achieve something similar here. So every one of you gets another 100 users to answer the survey. <laughs> that would be fantastic. We want to be also in the four digit number of respondents. Uh, that's the goal. And we, we got also different domains, 52% from life, physical or mathematical sciences, 32% from computer and information sciences, and 45% of them were developing data collection or are developing data collections, and 44% developed data analysis tools. So the community is very near to our community with the preservation of data and um, software. And we asked questions, for example, what services would be helpful for them, for, for a science gateway to, to help them in their project. There's, for example, the evaluation, impact analysis, website analytics, but also like adapting technology. And this is where we are also going here. And of this crowd, 67% said they want to adapt technologies. They want to use, reuse things, don't reinvent the wheel. So I think that's a really good indicator for our project also. Also to use some web visual graphic design, a lot of people um, that would like to do that 67%. And the next point, the next highest percentage was really saying, we want to choose from technologies and put things together. So that, that is great also for this project and we want to have usability services. And that relates also directly to this project saying, yeah, we have to make it easier. We, we have to go into the life cycle that also the researchers think, yeah, it, it's easy to use, it's intuitively. We can add it to our project. Something similar was in, in the um, survey that users said, yeah, we need all these different roles in a project that you have seen our stakeholders. We are also so diverse in the field, but we really also need to address the needs for different expertise for, for the different communities. And this, we, we asked them, for example, wished we had this expertise in the project. And yes, we had this. And if you have a look, a lot of people really would like to have a usability consultant or they would like to have a professional software developer or already had it, or a security expert. And at the end, 42% really wished they would have a quality assurance, a testing expert, which is also highly um, relating to this. Only a short thing. So the typical, <laughs> um, let's say typical life cycle still, unfortunately, of a science gateway is you have this great new project prototype. You have the early adapters, then it gets more publicity, wider adoption, the funding ends, or the PhD student has finished the work and the scientists get disillusioned because the science gateway is not continued. So we have to break the cycle and um, we will closely work together with the Science Gateways Community Institute, which has these five areas. So I'm part of the incubator and the community engagement and exchange. So this is my part of the community engagement. Um, and we offer these free services to really help with diverse expertise on demand, with longer term support of engagement. <coughs> we create software and visibility for gateways via outreach. And we have an information exchange um, focal point with the institute we are building up repositories for gateways. So we have already a list of over 1000 gateways and this repository will be published soon. Um, we have student opportunities for workforce development. So and these services are 100% free to you. We are partnering with different institutes and organizations and um, okay, nothing, nothing is always for free. You have to deal with us. You know, you have to hire us, yeah? <laughs> but you don't have to pay us, so that's nice. That was my science gateways community. <laughs> we appreciate it. <laughs> and Sandra, could you remind us when Science Gateways Community Institute um, was founded as an organization just recently, right? Just recently in August. So we started in August, and um, oh, yes, I should have put something like. Yeah, you no, I wanted that? to help bring that to our remote and in-room audience attention because 
the reason you might not have heard that you can get free extended developer support or free incubator service or uh, scientific software collaboration support from the Gateway Institute is they were just born in August yeah. out of the Science Gateway workshop series that you might be more familiar with. So um, please visit the website and um, learn more about the free services that are available to um, your uh, research projects and um, ways through the community engagement and exchange that you can make tools you develop um, part of the awareness of the Science Gateway community. Because if you have a tool they can use, they'll use it in their projects and vice versa. It's a great opportunity for all of us and we're thrilled that you guys exist now. And the press is being busy on the so we thank Sandra for that talk. Now I'd like to give you a little bit of background information about FigShare, Springer Nature, and Digital Science um, State of Open Data um, report and uh, the survey that um, results were released inside this report. This survey had uh, 2,061 respondents. Um, joining us today online is Dan Bellin from FigShare. If you have questions um, for Dan about what um, I present related to the survey, feel free to um, ask them during our discussion. Or um, for our online audience, um, type them through in chat to Sherry and um, we'll um, bring them uh, up for Dan and he'll see them online inside the chat if you chat to everyone. Um, so in the state of the open uh, data survey, um, the results are very well presented and there are a series of accompanying essays um, that help you put the survey in context of different countries uh, use of data and their needs. Um, we see here in figure four that the regularity with which the um, FigShare survey respondents made data free to um, access and reuse um, was only 24% said they never did it. So that means that um, we really are starting to reach a tipping point on data sharing. We can see in figure five, the um, column chart, um, that the respondents who have reused data made free by others, 57% um, had reused free data that others had shared. So it's becoming more and more important for doing research to have access to others' data when you read um, about their projects or you want to stand on the shoulder of giants and um, make your work have a bigger impact. And finally, um, in figure six to the far right, you can see the importance of freely available data to those who have reused it. And um, again, uh, only 5% um, uh, said it was of low importance and 12% were neutral about it. Everyone else agreed that the importance of freely available data for them to complete their work um, was highly important for them to be able to do their projects. Um, further on in the survey, we can take a look at researchers who have never made data openly available and are considering to do so. This to me is also um, a real indicator of change related to open data. The scientific life cycle, because it's often grant funded, can go in phases of as long as six, 10 years, depending on the length of your funding. So it's quite possible for a scientist who is on a um, four or five year project not to have released yet um, we might find some of them uh, among this audience of the approximately 90% plus who say, I haven't done it yet, but I'm planning to do so, either because my funder requires it or because I understand that the tipping point has happened and I will have co finished collecting my data and analyzing my results soon and I'm going to make this public. Um, the other thing we see are that um, even researchers um, who have e never made data open um, acknowledge that they're reusing data made open by others. So we know, even if we aren't sharers, that we're reusing other people's data and that allows us to do our work. And I think that's a really honest response to the landscape of data sharing right now, is figuring out that you're not always a giver, sometimes you're a taker. And systems that allow you to be either one of those at any time of need are really important. 
Um, in the State of Open Data report, there is an essay in the foreword um, by Mark Hennel, the founder of Big Share, and in it, um, I really liked these takeaway points that you see on the slide. Um, there's no simple solution to gather quality metadata around research outputs or to provide context in terms of quality. However, um, they acknowledge this has to become a multi-step process. And that's really what we're here today to talk about, is how do we do that as a community? How do we build that into the tools that we share with one another? And how do we make uh, data and software quality and the reuse of data and software an experience that's quality driven, where we have great confidence in the data that we were using from others, and we have great confidence that the data we put up for others to share um, will be of high quality and high fixity. So um, I invite you to um, read the State of Open Data report itself. There's a link in the slides. Yes, Sherry, do you have a question? Well, Dan wanted to point out that the data behind the survey is also available on Big Share. Super, yeah. <laughs> you can go and you'll see in my bibliography at the end of the slides a link to both the report and the data. But for many of these surveys we're um, reporting on, not only have they published results, they've also published their questionnaires and their data sets. And you'll notice in the survey you just took, as you become more familiar with some of the questions, we've repeated a few, one from each, so that we can get an indicator of um, whether uh, people's attitudes are changing or their practices are changing over time. Um, the next uh, um, survey I'd like you to uh, have a look at with me is the Open Data Researcher Perspective. This is the recent uh, survey that Elsevier released. Um, Ellen, Helena Kujin, who worked on this project, is online with us today, and her colleague Anita DeWard. They're happy to answer your questions during discussion and or um, online. Um, via the chat in today's um, uh, Zoom session. You can access that at presqt.crc.nd.edu. There's a link to the Zoom right on there, the one that our re remote participants are using. So you can feel free to hop on there and chat too. Um, in the um, Open Data Researcher perspective, um, they had a uh, multimodal approach. They did a survey tool um, they also um, had a, um, a disciplinary focus group set, and when you read the report, you can get a better feel for how they informed their project. We're talking now just about the survey part, um, and I'll take you through in the interest of time, because we all want to hear Mike talk just shortly after 10. Um, a little bit about the Elsevier results, but again, we can see that the majority of um, researchers, here we notice that a third have not shared their data from their last project. The good news about that is that 70% have. Um, and when we look at um, factors influencing sharing, this is one of the interesting takeaways from this survey. Um, when we look at who has used shared data in this survey, 48% are indicating they've used shared data. And when we look at the factors that help them decide um, whose data to use, um, the survey uh, takes us through a good list of what made people know that data was, was worth reusing, what made them aware of that data. So I think that's an important component of this survey. We also see a little bit about um, attitudes to research data and um, people's habits and the way they self-report them. And of great interest to us here today um, are starting to think about um, what's researchers' perception of who owns their data. Most still think that it's theirs uh, uh, alone before publication and that we notice after publication, um, acknowledgement begins to happen. So that remember the earlier question of what's the difference between share and publish? Sometimes at the moment of publication, other people begin to own your data. Maybe your funder, maybe your publisher, maybe your home institution, maybe your agency. And um, when we look uh, at how that correlates with who actually manages and impacts decisions about how to manage data, 
um, we can start to see the um, greater influence of funders. We can start to see the greater influence of departments, institutes, colleagues, collaborators, and publishers. Um, so um, when we look at the effort involved in making data um, reusable, um, we begin to see why if you wait till the end of your grant funded cycle, it's too late. We can also begin to see that the burdens um, people are under can be considerable. And finally, when we begin to look at um, who funds um, the uh, data management inside organizations and um, whether enough is allocated, it's all over the board. Um, so what I'd like for us to think about in the context of the survey and our conversations through the day is um, what kind of licenses uh, enable better sharing? What kinds of funding for curation and quality enable um, lower uh, resourcing for higher quality data sharing that can begin earlier in the life cycle? And um, finally, I invite you to um, peruse the bibliography in the slideshow. It'll bring you to links for each of these surveys and allow you to explore the data. There's a wealth of data out there from this handful of surveys, plus several more going back to 2009. I think the, um, one of those uh, at the bottom is uh, of the appendix. You'll see um, in uh, the one um, from the appendix from uh, Mike Pildress MPS uh, Open Data Workshop, there's a bibliography in there of uh, the rest of the surveys of interest. So you can really begin to explore this landscape of questioning on your own and use it to inform how you think about not just what your users need, but how others are reusing. It's uh, quite an interesting um, way to consider stakeholder engagement. So I'm going to be quiet now, invite any questions from the audience and um, from our chat participants particularly if you'd like to speak with Dan Balin from Figshare, Anita or Helena from Elsevier and their surveys. I know you just saw a brief, brief glimpse of them, but we'd like to thank them for joining us online. And if you have questions, let's hear them. Um, I cannot give a brief description of what Figshare is um, as well as Dan can. Um, but what I can do is um, bring a picture up online. Um, Figshare is a tool that scientists can use to share their data, get a, a permanent URL and a digital object identifier for their data. Um, so when we look um, in Figshare at a data resource, um, we can see a lot of information about um, how particular data sets are shared. I'm in. So now we have a FigShare page up on the screen. If you go to figshare.com, um, you can see an example of a data record on FigShare. Um, in each uh, record, you can um, see a citation with a title and authors for a particular resource. You can download that resource, share, cite it, or um, embed it in your own work. And you can also browse data sets that have been made um, publicly available um, by discipline. Here I'm viewing chemistry. You can look inside topics and further um, narrow your search. Um, let's um, take a look. Here's someone who shared a poster presentation, uh, perhaps given at a workshop or conference. Um, Figshare gave them an easy way to put that poster up and share it with their audience. It's taking a while to load here because it's probably really big. Um, but um, in uh, different scientific communities, um, People might share a data set, they might share a whole article and its associated data set, or they might use Figshare institutions or Figshare for journals to um, share uh, data sets related to particular publications. In this case, we can cite a data collection and we can um, begin to uh, look through the Journal of Organic Chemistry and peruse different topics. 
Um, so I hope that gives you a little um, bird's eye view of uh, flyover fig share and um, some of the kinds of things people share in there. You can filter by license type, um, do some sorting, upload your own data. And um, there are um, many uh, disciplinary communities using Figshare to do their data sharing. Do we have any other questions from audience? Or Dan, would you like to um, comment on um, what is Figshare? Nope. Is it okay if I come off mute or should I only chat directly with no, Shark? No, this is fine. We can hear you. Ah, cool. No, uh, thank you, Natalie. You hit, on, you hit on pretty much all the points there. Uh, the one thing I would want to note is uh, since we do work with publishers, you will see uh, some publisher branded content, which was that first example from the OSA that popped up when you were showing the screen. Um, we also uh, have open API documentation, which is in um, clearly visible when you first visit the site. And that's available at docs.figshare.com if you'd uh, like a little bit more information on um, the technical side. But yeah, um, Figshare as a way to um, publish those non-traditional research outputs. Um, and Natalie, like I said, Natalie did a, a really nice job of, of summarizing it. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate that. And um, feel free to contact Dan. You'll see um, his name in my slide deck, and um, he can help answer your questions about Figshare using the API with your systems that you might build. And um, if you're an individual, um, you can get started easily by pushing that upload button. Um, any questions about any of the other surveys or any immediate feedback about the PRES-QT needs analysis pilot that you took? Yeah. So for the, the survey that, that you put in front of us, I, I'm not sure how to answer it uh, in terms of my role as someone who does research, but also mm -hmm. someone who does uh, maintenance and, and supports a data repository. So right. I have a little bit of sort of trouble okay. figuring out what perspective do I use to answer this? Great. Great, that's a good observation. And Brandon, can you put your hand up? Um, Brandon, um, if you can give him your observation, we can use that to help audiences self-identify into those tracks so that they feel like they're answering honestly about their roles, even if there's someone who might occupy both roles on different projects. So we wanted a survey that if you were a researcher um, who, uh, often had to share your own data, but you might also um, have developed a system that does data sharing, or you might employ people who develop systems that you could answer um, as one person in both roles, but it's a really hard thing to pack into a single survey. So we're really trying to help figure out how to track people with the skip questions or allow them to self-identify in the different blocks of the survey. So I appreciate you bringing that up here. That was brought up online as well. Was it? Okay. It's time to identify who right. you are mm -hmm. as you start answering these questions. Right. Okay. Yeah. Maybe if we had an introduction, there are some self definitions that allowed people to identify which track they want to be on through the survey. Go ahead. Uh, this summary needs quite a few snippets. I was kind of wrong. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure which one. It'd be nicer if it was shorter. That was you and Cochran. He says, make it shorter. That's feedback worth hearing because we want people to actually take it. <laughs> Anyone else? Good. Well, um, I'm going to step aside and introduce you to Mike Hildreth. I'd like to thank um, the other members of the Press QT team. Um, we're here to talk to you and hear what you need. So um, let's keep those conversations going. <laughs>